10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2... Ladies and gentlemen, happy Tuesday. Hope you guys' week are going, is going great so far. I'm your host, Darren Williams Jr., and welcome to episode 97 of the Competition Plus Power Hour. As you can see, our original hosts, Lee Crab and Slam and Sam, are going to be out this weekend, so I'm going to take over here for this week, and I'm done babbling. Let's get on the man who runs the show, the one and only Mr. Bobby Bennett. Bobby, hey, how's it going, man? We get to play good cop, bad cop. <laughs> I'm excited. <laughs> How's everything going today? It's it's going great. Touchdown in the the land of the uh, stampede of speed. I'm here in uh, Waxahachie, Texas. Waxahachie, Waxahachie. It, it, it's I'm outside of the Texas Motorplex. Nice. It is officially Texas NHRA Fall Nationals Week, the Stampede of Speed. I was out there last year, had a lot of fun. And I tell you what, three races left to go in the NHRA season. The championship battles are heating up, and I'm looking forward to see how this whole thing plays out this weekend. It's going to be a lot of fun. It's going to culminate in one of the best season uh, seasons ever. I, I truly believe everything from pro stock bike to pro stock to funny car to top fuel has had levels of excitement that has been through the roof at times and i've seen many years you know that i was i was seeing this stuff when you wasn't even thought of kid <laughs> nah i'm for sure and then like we've, we've been saying it every week leah said this sam has said this every week top field is living up to the hype this year i'm talking about it eight seven or eight drivers separated between 88 points going down to these last few races of the season i mean that is just simply amazing reminds me of 1999 and kind of like the little parallel between 99 is that you had so many drivers still in the championship going down to the wire well, Tony Schumacher actually separates himself with a win and Dallas that year, won his first ever career race in Dallas that year and kind of separate himself from the pack. So a little parallel. We'll see if he can separate themselves here this weekend. Let me take you back even before, back when your dad and myself were old enough to sit around on Saturdays and watch Soul Train. <laughs> Let's go back to the 1980 season when we had as many as four to five top fuel teams in contention at the last race and Shirley mm -hmm. Muldowney beat out Gary Beck for the championship. Mm -hmm. Now I realize that, well, that's, you know, people don't care about that, but yes, that is our drag race in history. Mm -hmm. And uh, sure. it, 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 it was a great battle. That was a great battle between Lee Shepard and Bob Glidden too. Mm -hmm. And went down to the last run. So, you know, this year, I mean, it's living up to the hype. And, and yes, we've had to manufacture some uh, some rules and regulations and some format changes to to generate that excitement. But there is nothing that sucks worse than to have a champion already crowned by Dallas. Yeah. yeah. I mean, what excitement is there? No, for sure, for sure, and I definitely agree. And I want to go back a little bit into history as well. Since we're talking history, let's just go back even further. Well, actually, a little bit later, six years later, to Dallas. First ever nitro car down that racetrack, Daryl Gwynn, 526, 278. Is it true that he warmed up the car in the staging lanes? Is that true? That that's what what we heard. I wasn't here, but I that I would absolutely wow. believe that. Wow. 100 percent Wow. I mean, you would never see that today. Warm up the car in the staging lanes. Like they want to be, they wanted to be the first car down that racetrack because they knew all concrete facility, cool conditions, great racetrack. They wanted to set that record. And then you go out there and announce that you're teaming up with Budweiser and Kenny Bernstein. I mean, how amazing is that? Yeah. Well, there's no social media. There were no cell phones. So it's their word. So yeah, <laughs> it happened. There you go. There you go. Well, thank you guys all for tuning in here tonight. We got a packed show for you guys here today. Special show. Guess what we got? We got Corey Mihalik. You may know him as React 104. Did some great videography for the NHRA, sp sp specifically for Steve Torrance and Ron Caps. And then we got Justin Swanstrom. As you guys know, he is from Street Outlaws, No Prep King. So a really special and packed show here today, Bobby. I'm looking forward to it. Yeah, you had to call on me when I was getting my beer. <laughs> my bad. My root beer. Wait. Yeah, I was going to say, it's root beer. Root beer. Yeah. Yeah, you know, with Competition Plus, we try to be everything to everybody uh, in drag racing. And, and so we we reached out and started doing some stuff with the No Prep Kings. Uh, just just some of the drivers to introduce, you know, to our readers and just 
it, it's drag racing. I mean, yeah. yeah, in the beginning, the street outlaws, we were against it because it was on, you know, on regular streets and stuff like that. But now it, it's, it's a totally different, different ball game. I mean, they're yeah, on, sure. you know, nice tracks uh, and, and everything. So, you know what? That's drag racing, man. Nah, for sure. And you got you got cool hot rods, you got badass hot rods, you got great characters, you got great racing. I mean, it's a great organization. And I'm looking forward to talking to Justin. I've never talked to Justin before. I'm looking to hear about his background, uh, you know, his start from racing and his trajectory to where he is now. So looking forward to it. He has a big social media following as well. So looking forward to, you know, really diving deep into his career. Oh, yeah, definitely. Definitely. And the one thing that these guys are, I mean, yes, it's tight racing, but the racing is such a fraction of this whole deal it's all about yeah. the show yes. And, yes and basically drag racing had the show but it didn't have as tight and competitive racing back in the good old days mm -hmm. i mean there that it, it was it was so much of a show uh back then now it's it, it's more racing they've refined the the product to a point where you know there's no margin for error Nah, for sure, for sure. And so also we have Corey Mahalik, obviously, you know, great videographer. Um, you guys may know him, like I said, as React 104. I'm sure you've seen a lot of his work. I mean, the dude is very talented and I'm looking forward to talking to him today to him tonight. Well, here's a here's a little bit of trivia for those who have followed our road on on Competition Plus TV. Uh he shot the first feature that we did for Competition Plus TV in 2012 on a young rookie drag racer. You want to guess what their name was? In 2012. Yep. What class? Top Fuel. 2012 rookie. Calabalushi. Man, go. If I had a fish, that would hit you with well, it right now. Well, that was, that, that was Calabalushi's rookie year, 2012. That was his rookie year. Brittany Force. Brittany Force is 2013. Well, then it was 2013 when he did. <laughs> Come on, don't give me that. Brittany Force 2013. He shot the first real. <laughs> Produced video for Competition Plus. That's and awesome. That's the guy, awesome. The guy just oozes with talent. Whatever he touches turns to gold. Yeah, obviously. Yes, definitely. Definitely. I do agree with that. I want to bring up something I saw was very interesting. I don't mean to divert the conversation, but obviously, um, and this is kind of a little NASCAR talk too. So obviously they've been in talks with Dodge of returning into the series. But I mean, Dodge kind of came out this week and said, no, we are fully focused with Tony Stewart racing at NHRA. And I thought that was really cool to see. I, I watched a lot of NASCAR YouTubers and watched their videos. And, you know, it's really cool to see, hey, NHRA is being mentioned and having an OEM like Dodge saying, hey, no, we're fully invested in NHRA with all the participation. I thought that was really cool. I tell you, from the day I knew Tony Stewart was coming into drag racing, man, I was just overwhelmed and happy because I knew that we would get these kinds of moves in a corporate world. Without Tony Stewart, I'm not so sure that that kind of a conversation would have happened. Mm -hmm. But with Tony Stewart, and it doesn't matter how you get there, just get there. And we 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 have arrived. No, for We've sure, always for sure. been there, but this is a whole different level right here. No, yes, sir. And then what's cool, too, you got Rush Truck Centers on the side of Leah Pruitt's Top Field Jackster here this weekend. Obviously, if, if you know, that was Tony Stewart's sponsor when he was in NASCAR. So it's really cool things on the rise. I really do believe we're looking forward to see how it all plays out. I believe you, I believe what we will see in the coming years will be more NASCAR team owners opening up and, and bringing in drag racing teams as a value adder for their NASCAR programs. And, mm. and look, I got no shame with that. But hey, if you if if this is a selling point and it gets them in drag racing, that's that's fine. Hey, Rick Ware though said it in Charlotte, you know, before the semifinals, he said, Hey, more are coming. He said it to Joe Costello, more are coming. And I thought that was very interesting. And he's like, Hey, I'm happy we're the first ones testing out and see how it's going, but more are definitely coming. You already got Rick Hendrick, Rick Ware, Tony Stewart, but he says more are definitely coming. That that's really exciting to hear. Well, look at who who's already been here. Jack Roush was there. He was mm. uh partners with Wayne Gap and the Gap and Roush. Uh Pinto that won the, I believe it was, won the 73-74 World Championship. Uh, the the uh, Joe Gibbs was here. I mean, you, you just look at all the all the different ones that have come along. And, and mm -hmm. even Rick, Rick Hendrick started out as a drag racer. Yes. 
and then yes. went over to NASCAR. So, <laughs> you know, I, I think I think drag racing is, is a ripe a ripe field for mm. expansion. Definitely. Uh, real quick, Bobby, we have Elon Werner in studio. You want to bring him on right now, or what do you want to do? Let's bring him on. All right, you want to go to commercial first? Yes. All right. Sorry, my uh, I have one job. We'll go to commercial. Wait a, minute, bring on. Wait, a minute. wait a minute before you go. What's I just up? got to tell you about the fine folks at Weldon Pumps. They have re-upped on your, but based on your support of our our programs here at Competition Plus, the videos, the video content. Uh, Weldon Pumps will be back with us for the 2023 season. Let the let the roll that beautiful pump footage. Let's do it. Elon Warner, how's it going, man? Man, I'm so happy to be with you guys. Darren, Bobby, living the dream. How are you guys doing? Can you guys hear me okay? I had to I had to run out. I started up and then you guys I left. I forgot my headphones. So it's been that kind of day. So thank you guys for having me on. Wow, you've got one of the greatest weeks in drag racing going on, promoted by one of the greatest PR people in the world. How can it get any better? Well, good. Good weather, cold beer, fast race cars. <laughs> We're going to have all that, you know, starting, you know, this really right now. We got Pro Mods, Top Dragsters uh, on track right now, tearing it up. We had Scott Palmer's Nitro Sideshow last night, which was amazing. Uh, Funny Car Chaos wrapped up their season. Um, had a concert. We did a Brett Young, Wade Bowen concert Sunday night. Had about 20,000 people here in the pit area. We had Scott Palmer racing Alex Laughlin in their top field dragsters during the concert. Had Joe Costello, the voice of Stampede of Speed, on the starting line, talking to them, did burnouts, ran the races. All the fans were watching the concert, piped it over. So we proved you can do racing and concerts at the same time. So, And we haven't even started the, the NHRA Texas Fall Nationals yet. Man, leave it to Billy Meyer. Leave it to Billy Meyer, the guy who dreamed big and delivered big in drag racing to pull something like this. You guys, you guys like this background? Do you guys see it. this? So this is the background. We're doing a champions dinner tomorrow night at the Champions Club. Uh, last year's former Texas Fall Nationals winners, Ron Caps, Justin Ashley, Greg Anderson, Matt Smith. This is the this is the setup. So this is the backdrop for that. Uh, Played at dinner, the, the drivers and riders got to pick the menu. Uh, everybody that has bought a ticket will get their picture with all four of the winners from last year. Printed out on the spot. Our buddies at Redmond Marketing that used to run the Mellow Yellow Station, uh, Mike Adams and Jim Bailey are on the scene, doing a great job. They're running our Welcome Center. Enjoy a dinner, Q&A with some of the drivers, and then we're doing a George Strait tribute band concert afterwards behind the tower. Bobby, you'll be here, I know. I'm excited to, to show, but it's going to be – um, I think we've got the four winners from last year. Plus, we invited every former Fall Nationals winner to join us. Wow. I know Tony Schumacher's going to be here. Matt Hagan's going to be here. Matt Hartford, Jim Yates, Eddie Craywick. Um, I know Erica Enders is going to be here. Um, it's just going to be – it's going to be a night to celebrate the folks that won the Texas Fall Nationals. Wow, sure. Real quick, Elon, though, you mentioned the menu. What, what's on the menu for uh, for tomorrow night? All right, so this year, this is the first time I've ever done it. Um, I'm kind of a golf fan. It's my favorite activity when I'm not racing to fall asleep to on the couch on Sunday afternoons. So the Masters, when you win the Masters, the previous year's winner gets to select the dinner, and it's only the people that have ever won the Masters. They get to make the menu. So we stole the page from them. So... We let the Nitro guys pick the entrees. So Ron Caps picked filet mignon. Justin Ashley picked chicken primavera. Um, Greg Anderson picked lemon meringue pie for dessert. 
and then Matt Smith picked chocolate cake. So you'll get filet mignon, chicken primavera, sides, rolls, salad, all that good stuff. And then for dessert, you'll have one of those two options. And then next year, we'll flip it. The pro stock guys will get to pick the entrees, and the nitro guys will pick the desserts. Well, who's the shooter McGavin out of that group? Oh, I mean, let's be honest. You know, it's it's Matt Smith. It's Matt Smith. I mean, he's I mean, he's got he's got the look. He's got the attitude. Um, you know, I'm just exci- I'm really excited about this event um, because we need to celebrate our winners, and we want them, we want this to be a fun event, a celebratory event, and then let the drivers get busy trying to you know we got fourth race of the countdown. Uh, we got bonus money on the line Friday night, fifteen thousand dollars to the quickest top field drags for quickest funny car and Friday night second qualifying session as part of our Friday night live program. Seventy five hundred dollars to the quickest pro stock car, five grand to the quickest pro stock motorcycle. And as you go, as you progress through that qualifying session, you know the first pair down there, that you know that driver is going to be the quickest. We have a saddle at the top end with a backdrop, and they get to sit on the saddle, and we have the big check. And as guys are going, when someone runs quicker than you, you have to get off the saddle and give them the check until last man or woman standing. So it's going to be an exciting deal. So we're we're fired up. You know, Billy, Christy Myers, or Christy Meyer, and um, her husband Barry Johnson have done so much to make this facility. Facilities never look better. Um, we're just excited to have a countdown race to be able to bring all these champions in and just really put on a good show for the fans from not only all over Texas, but all over the country. Well, if if you do a mechanical bowl down at the finish line, that could be more entertaining, but just oh. don't let Al Segrini work it. Let me tell you something. You guys know DeMarcus, DeMarcus from the track, our competition, one of our track guys. We had bull riding on Sunday as part of our uh, Texas over, uh, Stars Over Texas Festival. Had a whole board. Demarcus rode an actual bull. He had never ridden a bull in his life. He got on a bull and rode it for two and a half seconds before it bucked him off. <laughs> we will be posting that video on our Texas Motorplex social media channels later. It's the most amazing feat of sudden expertism I've ever seen in sports. <laughs> oh my but, goodness. It is it the video is unbelievable. And the, this is a bowl that was actually in competition that actual cowboys didn't stay on for two seconds. And Demarcus rode it for almost almost three seconds, like two point six seconds. Wow. 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 That's amazing. So we will so we have real bowl, right? But we do have a mechanical bowl here in the kid corral. <laughs> now, well, like last year, so I went to the Stampede of Speed last year, and I'll tell you what, it took, I think the Nitro session started at 8 o'clock. They didn't get done to yeah. around a little bit after 11, because, like, I mean, so many blow-ups. Okay. I remember guys getting into the wall, okay. blowing up, but... Darren, I thought that, we were friends. I thought we were friends. What's up? Just bringing up that last night, Friday night session with just that was, all the oil downs. You that know, was so you know, fun, though. It was fun, but you know, you know, you know, everyone talks about leakers and guys that come to the races. You know who was the biggest culprit of that? Some spare guy named John Force. <laughs> Blue his yeah, car up, blew his car up, raised for 15 grand, pedaled it like 37 times in the first thousand feet. I mean, it was nuts, but what are you going to do? He's got big money on the line, you know, bragging rights. So, yeah, so we're going to run a much better show this Friday night. Um, but yeah, it's it's a spectacle. We got um, Laney Newman here. He's an amazing entertainer running the DJ, um, kind of on par with, uh, with Jason Logan. So, the, the entertainment factor, laser shows, smoke machines. That Friday night session is like, the WWE meets drag racing meets, you know, the best heavy metal concert you've ever been to. Well, I mean, you know, you mentioned- Elon, I know you go, Bobby. Uh, you know, Elon, I was thinking about, about the Friday night show and that's not mm-hmm. so much for the crowd that gets on the NHRA.TV as it is the in person crowd to entertain them. I mean, would, would, you, would that I'll be accurate? Yeah. That? I think so. We would like to make it enjoyable for the people watching on NHRA TV, but when you're here in person and you're taking in the full experience of the music and the light show and all over the Watusi uh, walking up the track and you just see so much more in the experience um, of being here live, uh, 
conditions should be great. You're, we're going to see eight foot header flames. You know, I think there's a chance we could see somebody not only collect the fifteen thousand dollar Stampede of Speed bonus, but that thirty thousand dollar Phillips Connect first to three hundred at the eighth mile. I mean, you can see a guy or gal make a run that's basically worth forty five thousand dollars. I love hearing that. You know, and that's that's the cool and he, and here's the irony. I, I joke with people about this. Um, you know, Jim Epler is now a Phillips Connect Mr. Three Hundred, got the first three hundred run in funny car. Uh, kinda got it right before John Force could get it. Now Jim Epler's back on the sport and we're so thankful that he's involved with Phillips Connect and Justin Ashley. Um, now he's got this program and I think there's a very li- real likelihood that Brittany Force could be the first, you know, to go 300 at the eighth mile. So I think the symmetry of the universe where Epler snuck in and got Force's money, the universe may completely come full circle and another Force may take some Epler money. But I think Epler's still ahead because I think he got twenty five grand, and um, no, so he got thirty thousand. So he's paying more money than Force. So yes, yeah, so it's a good deal. So yes, yeah, so it's going to be exciting. And I think just the whole, the whole show here is just um, kid corral pit area, uh, just really kind of a cool deal. Like no other event, we want people to come in and stay five or six days, see concerts, you know, meet drivers, have unique experiences. We've got the fan fest tomorrow night in downtown Waxahachie. Uh, we have over 50 drivers committed to being there, and it's everybody from Top Fuel, Funny Car, Pro Stock, Pro Stock Motorcycle, Pro Mod. Um, got a couple top alcohol drag for guys. It's going to be a crazy event just to get free autographs. And that's from Elon, 7 until 8.30. Elon, whose idea was the Stampede of Speed? Where did, where did that come from? It was really a – collective effort last year we have been working with the state of texas to build our venue to raise the profile of drag racing not just in the state of texas but across the country Um, in order to do that you need to have multi-day events like the super bowl like the final four where you're encouraging people to come in from out of state and stay multiple days so as a group we just started talking about what else could we do okay we can do professional testing on wednesday Oh, we could have a pro mod race. We want to do pro mods. And then talk on Scott Palmer, Nitro Sideshow. And it just kind of reverse grew um, from that. And then we're like, well, let's have a let's have a concert the weekend before and try to get people to come to the track and that may never have been to a drag race before. Mm-hmm. Um, so between Christy and Barry and the, the team here, they all came up with these ideas. And it was really a, a team effort because and that's what's so great about the Motorplex is it came up as a team effort and then we work on everything as a team. And now we're all spending hours and hours and hours here at the track, putting on good events for folks as a team. And Christy and Barry and Billy are great leaders. The passion they have for the sport, for growing the sport, for trying new things, um, just really it just infuses through everybody in the organization. And it's really cool to see what you guys are doing. This isn't just a race. This is a spectacle, making your event in a spectacle. Do you think other tracks in the future will start to follow suit and try to, you know, maybe not as big, but try to follow suit and make their things more of an, more of an, ev- an event? I hope so. I think you can you can kind of see the Texas Motorplex effect in a couple places. Um, many years ago, we started giving the custom cowboy hats when you won our race. That's one thing. Um, the Wally is great. I will never take anything away from the Wally, but I think we may have talked about this on other shows. You win a Wally for winning an international event, but you should win something for doing something at the track. So we started doing custom hats. So you get the Wally and you get a Motorplex stamped custom hat for everybody that wins, every category. Now you're seeing tracks like Sonoma doing a wine chalice. Bill Bader does ice cream scoop. Uh, Kenny Koretsky came right in, bought Maple Grove, did custom cornhole um, boxes. Um So those are the things we want to see other tracks emulate. I think you'll see hopefully more tracks and NHRA is trying to have concerts. I mean, they're also trying new things, which I think is important. And we're working in conjunction with NHRA. They are giving us some latitude um, to try new things. Um, You know, we started, you know, a couple years ago to introduce both drivers at the same time on Sunday. 
and that's now become a thing. Um, you know, so I, I, we do track operator meetings with the NHRA. They host them right around SEMA. We're going to bring our ideas and any other tracks that want to try to do things. We are going to be more than helpful to give them ideas of how to do things, how to maybe work with your state or county to help you finance them. So um, it's a big, it's a big deal. And I, and I think we're all going to see us moving to that. And I think we're seeing now the inception of events that can grow into bigger deals. The Scott Palmer Nitro Sideshow it can be, who knows the positive things that can be, you know, but they're, you know, Travis Pastrana, you know, we're going to talk to a lot of other people that are going to be here this weekend about what we can do to help our event grow and bring in new people. Tony Stewart's in town doing Speedway Children Charities things tomorrow. We reached out, you know, Leah and Matt are going to do some appearances and things like that. Matt introduced the Matt introduced uh, Brett Young on Sunday night. He was here in town doing PBR stuff. He got up there and introduced Brett Young. And I mean, that's what we need to do. We need to get our drivers in front of different audiences. And so Tony's going to invite some of his VIPs to come out to the race this weekend. We're going to put them in the Champions Club. And the goal is to we got a big tent here. We got a lot going on, and I think it's just a lot of opportunity to expose people to an event that is unique, that's fun, that, I mean, what's more American than drag racing and just really have a family fun event that can be entertaining for anybody. Elon, one last question here. How is Billy Meyer handling this thing? He has to be like a kid in a candy shop. He is in his element. He was great during funny car chaos. There's actually one of his old funny cars out here, the motivator funny car. And a real quick funny story about that. Billy heard this guy was running his funny car and was worried about liability because it looked just like his motivator funny car. And he's like, that guy can't run my funny car. I mean, I'll get, he crashes and I'll get sued. You need to tell him to change his car. And then he found out the car was winning a lot of nostalgia races. And he's like, well, maybe he just takes my name off of it. It'll be fine. <laughs> Billy likes winners. Billy likes winners. Billy likes to be successful. He sees this event um, as a great opportunity for him to help innovate the sport again, just like the Motorplex did in 86 we're going to keep trying new things some things are going to work some things aren't but we will continue to do everything we can to make the stampede of speed the fastest 10 days of motorsports in texas um, the must-see event for racing and entertainment fans hey that sounds perfect elon hey thank you for coming on the show hey, here anytime hey. anytime i appreciate you guys yeah, I, real quick, I got one quick question, and I, I may start. I might start some trouble with this one, but I gotta ask it. So you mentioned you mentioned the the first of the uh, first of the three hundred and the eighth, everything yep. like that. Maybe Brittany Force could do it, stuff like that. So you right. mentioned uh, John Force back in the day. Obviously, he put up cash will put up one half of the money, and then John Force yep. put up the other half of the money, right. and he got his pocket picked. Do you think it's yep. only fair that Jim Epler puts up another half of the money, doubles up, you know, kind of hey. a little bit? Huh? I got out of the business of spending other people's money a long time ago. That's real easy for PR people to do. We come up with these great ideas. I'm like, this is a great idea. Who has the money to pay for it? So I think the fact that we have this kind of excitement that we're talking about, yeah. this deal is great. Where the money comes from, I don't, you know, I don't really I don't think the racers care. Um, but I think if this the balance of the universe, I know Epler's really excited, wants to, you know, would obviously love to see Justin get it. But I think the excitement of just seeing somebody go 300 miles per hour. Yeah. At the eighth mile, which I think actually has already happened. I, Sean Langdon ran 300, I think, at the eighth mile in testing a few years ago. So it can be done. The conditions just have to be really, really right. So it's going to be an exciting weekend. We're going to have some of the best racers in the country here. And I just appreciate all the coverage and the time tonight, fellas. So you guys have a, have a, have a great evening. Have a great rest of the show. For sure. Thank you for coming on, Eli. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Awesome. Well, I tell you what, the guys have it going on down there at, at the Motorplex. And I tell you what, I, I know you were like, what, negative seven years old when the Texas Motorplex came in, came onto the scene here. And, and we we have always said it was one of the seven drag racing wonders of the world. Ah, for sure, for sure. And I mean, I mentioned, you know, Daryl Gwynn, 526, 20, 278. But I mean, he comes back the following year, goes 280 in the Budweiser car. I mean, that place is just known for speed. You know, they just lay down great performances there all the time. He sees some great, I mean, action there. You talk about, you know, that big crash in 05 between uh, Bruce Allen and Kenny Koreski. I mean, just so many great memories there. I mean, this has been, you know, 
1986, these dudes have just always put on great performance at the Texas Motorplex. And kind of sad I'm not going there this year. I'm kind of kind of bummed out. <laughs> well, we tried to get you here, but it just didn't work yeah. out. But I, yeah. I, I, I have to tell you <laughs> that Kenny Koretsky and Bruce Allen, I, I was supposed to have been there and mm. would have witnessed that, mm. but I was in the hospital at that, that moment. Oh, for real? Yeah, I had a, a severe kidney stone, had mm. to have a surgery to remove it, and I had Mm, that was wow. just a bad day all the way around. Man, man, I, I've never had a kidney stone. And I hope I never do experience that. But yeah, but just just going off of that, I mean, you, you think about Domper Dome's final win there in 94. Um, Corey Matt going uh, over 320 miles per hour there, I believe 97. I mean, just so many great memories from the Texas Motor Plex. I can go on and on and on, but I mean, just a, just a magnificent facility. I mean, when we saw the first runs out there uh, from like the Raymond Beetle and, and, and from uh, – Tom McEwen and, and Billy Meyer and all of those guys. I mean, we just knew that this place was going to be something special. I mean, when when Eddie Hill ran the first four second run, and yes, that was in IHRA, the I side. Gene <laughs> Snow made the first uh, four second run in the NHRA competition. You know, so yes. it it was a the place is just so full of drag racing history. And, and I have to tell you, there was a lot of people that didn't believe Billy Meyer could pull it off when he mentioned what he was going to do. Because making a complete quarter mile of concrete, that just didn't happen. I yeah. mean, back in those days, I mean, if you drove on a concrete highway, it was, you know, where you're going down the road. But uh, it was just, uh, hats off to Billy Meyer. Sometimes, you know, as my my one of my favorite football coaches used to say, no risk it, no biscuit. <laughs> I like it. I like it. Let me preface by saying something real quick. So the last question I asked Elon, total joke, total joke. I'm just, just bringing up a little drag racing history, but total joke talking about Epler uh, doubling up the money. So just want to preface by saying that. Dude, we check our feelings at the door. You, you, can, <laughs> you can lay it on. If I haven't hurt anybody's feelings, you don't have to worry about it either. Gotcha, gotcha, gotcha. So any any other drag racing news out there, Bobby, you want to fill us in on? Well, uh, you know, one of the articles that we had, uh, you know, on the magazine, and, and it's and it's been a long time coming, uh, was about the Camaro. Why why is the Camaro the most dominant pro stock car ever? Well, it was built to be that way. It was built to dominate. It was built to go head to head with the uh, Mustang once GM figured that the Corvair was not going to get it done <laughs> and, and built the Camaro and the Camaro was, and, and if not for, I, I don't even have words disgusting enough to describe when they let the Vega and the Pintos into pro stock, because uh, basically pro stock was supposed to be factory hot rods to match a, a platform that you could get in the car. And there was never a day that a V8 rolled out off the showroom floor in a Vega or a Pinto. Mm -hmm. I mean, it just didn't happen. And, and that's the only thing that could have stunted the Camaro's growth because otherwise it would have been a Camaro all the way through pro stock. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, and then by the late seventies, then the, 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 um, uh, the importance of overhang started to help the teams out and you started to see the teams venture towards uh, the Camaro. Uh, for sure. For sure. And I mean, just all throughout the history of pro stock, just aside from the Camaro, you know, we've heard a lot of people complain, you know, why is it, you know, they call it pro stock Camaro. I've seen another one of your articles about that, but I mean, in general, throughout the history of pro stock, we've always seen general motors kind of dominate the class and, and have pretty much make up most of the field throughout the whole history of pro stock. So this is pretty much nothing new when it comes to general motors in pro stock. Yeah. I mean, it, it, you're looking at a manufacturer that had, you know, close to 60% of the entries accounted for 60% of the entries in pro stock, mm -hmm. even in the so-called glory days, mm -hmm. you know, yes, there were Fords. Yes, there were uh, American motors and yes, there were, uh, you know, Chrysler's, Mobars, Plymouth Dodge. Yes, there was all of that. 
But once the NHRA went to the the box uh, the box body where everything had to fit in a template, that pretty much did away with alternate body styles. When they went away from the uh, and, and this is what people get get wrong is that once they went away from the steel roof and quarters, that meant that to do another body style had to come with approval from the manufacturer. And, uh, you know, the manufacturer was going to create the body style that, that, you know, had the best chance of winning the swoopiest Mm -hmm. design. Well, Chevrolet, what are you going to go with? Mm -hmm. You can't run a Corvette because the Corvette was never legal. It's the Camaro. Mm-hmm. It was the Camaro. It was always the Camaro. Uh, from, sure. from 2012 when it came out, you had no other choice. Well, mm-hmm. without Ford putting any money into the program, unlike it was doing in the 80s and 90s and uh, everything. I think we got Justin in. Uh, mm-hmm. I think we got yeah. him in the studio. So let's run the competition products uh, commercial and bring on Justin. Let's do it. Competition products. Your source for hardcore engine parts for street, strip, and oval track. Our free catalog is packed with hundreds of product lines from the best known manufacturers in the performance industry. Lowest prices guaranteed. Free shipping and handling on all orders over $149 in the continental U.S. Need expert advice? Our knowledgeable staff is just a phone call away. Competition products. Race parts sold by racers since 1970. Justin Swanstrom, thank you for coming on with us tonight, man. How's it going? What's up? Can y'all hear me? Yeah, we can hear, yeah, you. We can hear you. We can't see you, but we can hear you. <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm driving down the road right now. Fucking, this is probably the worst. Uh, I'm probably one of the worst guests ever because last week I missed. I was in the middle of the boonies. This week I don't have a phone charger, so I'm on 19%. So I'm going to run with y'all until my phone goes dead. We're going to make the most of that time. I, I'll tell you what, I wrote my first article on Justin, and, and he gave me the greatest quote. And, and just it, it just set the stage for the whole article when he says, I love to drag race, I love to gamble, and I love to talk crap. Although he didn't say crap, but that just said it right there. Tell me how that just just makes you fit right in with the No Prep Kings group, doesn't it? Yeah, I mean, uh, no prep kings is uh, I mean, it's a it's an excellent form of racing. Um, it's it's grown pretty big. Um, it was it was big before I got there. I'm just glad to be a little part of it to be able to try to make it a little bit bigger. Um, but uh, the guys, the the original uh, crew, you know, the 405 and all them, they 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 went from the street over to the track and they put a deal on in Bristol and. Um, they started running uh, a series of no prep kings at eight races. It moved up to ten, and then it got to twelve, and it's at sixteen now. Um, so it's it's a very it's a very hardcore sport. And I tell people all the time, if you're gonna run no prep kings, I mean, you, you got one, you got to have a lot of heart, and two, you just got to know that it's gonna be a lot of traveling. It's gonna be a lot of mental. It's gonna be a lot of physical. Um, and you're gonna you're gonna have to put everything in it if you want to be good at it because uh, there is 44 other teams that's wanting to do the same thing you're doing, and then you got five or six teams that are your very very top elite guys and girls that are gonna try to load you up on the trailer at any given point. So you gotta you gotta be willing to put in a lot of work and uh, be strong will and have a lot of heart to be able to run with the No Prep King crew. Uh, for sure, for sure. And we just heard, you know, the quote that uh, from Bobby. So I got to ask you, just off rip. I mean, you drive bad, fast hot rods. You have a big social media following. You got a big YouTube following. I mean, you get to travel the country. Just from your perspective, how much fun are you having right now doing what you get to do? Um, I tell people all the time, the day, the day that I don't have fun will be the day that I sell it all and I go do something different. Um, I, I can't honestly say that I've done a lot of racing. I've been in a lot of different classes and no prep kings is one of the the best racing to be part of um it is i mean from from being organized to to running on a time schedule to to uh hanging out with the fan base um talking shit with the drivers having fun with everything uh i don't really think there's any other sanction 
out there that is uh, as successful and as fun as uh, the Street Outlaw No Prep Kings. I tell you what, Justin, I'm I'm thinking that this thing keeps going the way it's going. I'm going to invest in bu- doing my own chassis building business on the No Prep King series because, man, y'all tear some stuff up, don't you? I was about to say it. Y'all tear um, some stuff up, man. Well, I, I will say this. Um, there, uh, Granted, there is. I, I tore a lot of stuff up this year. A few of them weren't, weren't my fault. Um, for the most part, I think we've had – so I wrecked, uh, David Atkins wrecked, Tony McKinney wrecked, and I think – well, Lizzie's wrecked, and then uh, uh, Bodie scuffed the wall one time. So, you know, five five cars. But if you look at a lot of these other events that we go that people go to, there's stuff that happens at, at those events as well, from radio racing to pro mod to to pro mod and NHRA to top fuel. So, I I do I do think that people try to say, oh, it's it's a it's a death wish and and uh, that. They're out there just destroying cars. Every sanction out there racing destroys cars. It just matters when it's going to happen. Our stuff's a little bit different because we do run on no prep tracks. So we have to be a little bit more careful. And uh, there's stuff. There's more stuff that can happen. I tell people all the time, if you run on no prep, it will definitely make you a better driver. There's been times that I've rolled back over into a pro mod class or a radial tire class. And I have been a better driver. I've been able to be more comfortable with the car, drive it out of what somebody else would have possibly lift. And I'm not saying that's the right way, but running on a no prep surface will make you a better driver. Just like I think running on the street with them makes them a better driver. I I have always said I feel Ryan Martin, Daddy Dave, Kai Kelly, uh, Sean Murdernova. They are like your top elite drivers, and I will put them against any driver out there in any sanction of, uh, of sport for the drag racing because there's just stuff that they've done, and, and they're, they're leaps and bounds ahead of me. They've been doing it longer than me. Um, I, I feel like I'm a good driver. Uh, I did get into the wall one time, but like I tell people, when we run on no prep, when it rains at some of these other events, you see people out there that are – dragging the track they're putting spray down they're spending an hour hour and 15 minutes we don't we don't do that over here we fucking go out there and broom the track and once you get the water off and they take that blower and they get blowing it you better hope you're not in the burnout box because you're going down the track it's just it is what it is when somebody oils a track down you better hope you're not in the burnout box because they're going to go out there and put some cat litter on the track soak the oil up and they're going to broom the shit off to the walls, and they're going to send you back down through there. It, it, it sucks to be you if you're behind somebody that oils the track down. Now, granted, tracks do get a little bit better later on in the night because you got everybody out there doing 300-foot burnouts. So, to the 330, some tracks can get better than others because you got big tire cars, and you have a lot of them on the property are laying rubber down, and that's it. But from the 330 to the 8th mile, it could be an ice skating ring. I mean, hell, we were at one event where we're running on no prep, and it's 52 degrees outside. It was like an ice skating ring on some of the passes we made. And there's stuff that we have to do to the cars. There's things we got to change in the tune-up to be able to go out there. And I, I see a bunch of – there's every now and then you see a bunch of pro mod guys jump on there, and they're like, oh, I can do this or I can do that. Or they'll come to one event, and they go, oh, I went down the track. Y'all call this hard. I tell all the pro mod people whenever they want to come over when they think they want to run or do whatever. And for the most part, half the time they can't get down the track. Other times they're turning sideways because it's a different style of racing. Um, it, we're not out there going fucking 360s like the pro mod people are, but we're not running on a prep track. So when people, when I laugh at it, when people come on there and they say, oh, we can go do it too. Everybody's allowed to come out and try it. Not everybody's going to make it down through there. It's just how it is. But um, and, and and that's where it comes into play about being able to run on no prep, tune for no prep, drive on no prep. It's just a whole different style of racing um, when it comes down to it. Hey, Darren, let me have a follow up here. Yeah. <laughs> uh, you know, what's you know, what's been really incredible is how quick you guys 
get these cars in an in in unfortunate incident. The, you're able to turn these cars around really, really quick. I mean, that, that's as in, impressive as to see. What, as in what? When you wreck them or? Well, yeah, yeah. When, when there's been an unfortunate incident, I mean, you guys turn these cars back well, around pretty quick. I think, I think that also comes down to whoever – whoever's running the team and, and the driver, uh, I feel like anybody could do that. I mean, even if pro mod guys, if they were to go out there and wreck their car or top fuel, if they were able to wreck it, if they have a chassis shop that's able to put in the work and and do that, they could get the same exact treatment. I mean, it's not just no prep that, that can turn their cars around just as fast. It just depends on what shops they're dealing with, who they're dealing with, and if they're wanting to – to to work as hard to put the car back together i mean for me i've always said i've i've hit every race this year i've been lucky to be able to hit every race last year and this year so far but i tell people all the time people literally save up their hard-earned money and their hard-earned time to come out and watch us i have a pretty big fan base does everybody like me of course not does everybody love ryan of course not he's got his fans he's got people that don't like him but at the end of the day, those fans that do like them or not like them, whatever, they still they still spend their hard-earned time and hard-earned money to come out there and watch them. So that's why I've always made it uh, uh, a job of mine to make sure that I can try to hit every event. I will literally do whatever it takes to be able to make it. And if I can't make it, then everybody knows that I tried my hardest to be able to make it there. And that's what the whole deal behind that getting that car done and we did it in three days uh and then we left we had to drive for 24 hours to get up there and it was it was miserable it was a miserable week for my chassis guys cameron johnson and them my whole team my dad uh me myself i mean that whole week i probably got six hours of sleep out of the whole entire week but like i said i was willing to do whatever it took and there was a lot of times where my guys were wanting to give up, and I and I had I just told them I said, man, we've already been this far. We might as well try to finish it. Like, there's no point if we if we forget if we give up now, then it'd be worth it'd be it'd be for nothing. So that's the reason why we were able to put that together. And and I have a great team around me. I have great supporters, great sponsors, and we were able to get it done and go out there. But um, I, I I'm all for the fan base, the fans, and I make it very clear at every event. The fans is what keeps it together. Us 32 drivers, we can't keep a track open. Yeah, we uh, uh, we come there to race or whatever, but the fan base is what keeps tracks open. They're the ones that spend the money. They're the ones that uh, gossip and talk about it and get other people to come out there. Us drivers, we we are you, they're, diamond does it. You can go get another one. Now, some of them may not have the fan base that others got. I get that, but at the end of the day, fans should never forget that they are the reason that we are able to do what we do now. Uh, for sure. For sure. And you mentioned a while ago, you know, kind of like the thin line you guys are on with these no prep tracks. I just got to ask you in your mind, do you feel like you guys don't get enough credit as to how great of a driver you guys actually are? I don't think it matters. Uh, I, one thing I've learned about the no prep deal is they there it's, it's, and I'm not going to say it's a tight knit family. I mean, it is, I mean, I feel like all the drivers are together. But they're not out there. They're not out there. That's one thing I don't see is the no prep people over there talking about they can go do this or they can go do that, blah, 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 where I, I feel like they know they're good drivers. They don't they don't need they don't need to be told. They don't they don't they don't care about nothing else because our our racing, our fan base is so much different than than any other sanction out there. You know, anybody that drives a Lexus drag car just peaks the the coolometer on my in my books. Why a Lexus? Why a Lexus? Yeah. Why oh, a Lexus? There was an echo there. Um, so to be honest, I, I've always been I've always wanted to try to be different. I mean, I try to I do social media for a living. I, I've always wanted to uh, to be different and do something different. And I was talking with Cameron at the time and everybody, and I almost did a Nova. I almost did a Camaro. Everybody and their brothers got a Camaro or a Mustang. And I was talking with my chassis guy and I told Cameron, I said, you know what? Why don't we do something different? And he was actually building an import car at the time 
I think it was a, a Scion. And uh, he said, why don't we do an import? And I was like, what are you talking about? He's like, well, let's just do a Lexus. And I was like, well, nobody's got that out there. So I think it'll be beneficial and it'll be good. And it did. My brand, uh, my brand is a Lexus. So my first car, prenup, it was a 2018 RC350. Nobody else in No Prep Kings has that car. That's one thing I can't say that nobody has out there. I'm building a brand new car right now. I just went and got fitted for it today. It is a 2022 RCF model. It's kind of similar to my other Lexus. The front end changes a little bit and the headlights and grill change a little bit um, on it. But nobody else out there has that. There is nobody out there in any racing that has a 2022 RCF. So it's it's cool to be on, on my end because it's a different style car. Uh, I, I don't have to see 10 to 20 of the same style cars doing the same thing. Anybody, if you guys got any questions for Justin, send them in. I'll show them on the show. But I got to ask you, um, just so about the name Prenup. Can you fill us in on that? How did you get the name Prenup? I think that's like pretty awesome. Um, actually, uh, I got a buddy of mine, uh, Dre Gray. He's the one that came up with the name. Uh, I've, I've always I've always had names of the cars growing up in the, the grudge racing. I mean, I've had a lot of names. I've had, I've had Hand Me Down. I've had Bodacious, Armageddon, Apocalypse. Uh... We had Alcatraz. So I have always had like a, a car. I feel like a car should have a name. It should have its own identity and it should be something uh, in the, the mean of it. So then I started, I started running MPK um, in 2019. I had a car named Carnage and uh, that was the white. It was a fifth gen Camaro. We ran it for a little bit. We got rid of it. I decided we got hit with COVID in 2020. I wasn't sure I was going to get invited, but at that time, I knew what I wanted to do with my career. I wanted to run no prep. It didn't matter if it was on Street Outlaws or we were going to go hit just local backwoods tracks. So I sold everything I had, and I built the new car. I came up with Justin Swanstrom 69. That was my car number at the time was 69, and me being a younger younger group, I, uh, I had a younger fan base, and it was more just like kind of a, a joke, and I, I put it on online, and I said, to anybody that comes up with a name, I'll give you $100 and a free T-shirt. So I had a buddy of mine that I race in grudge racing, Dre Gray. He hit me up and he said, you want to know a name that nobody else out there has? And I said, what's that? And he said, Prina. And it just clicked. And then just exactly what it did. And then I try to keep the names as we go. I got a little street car at the house. We call it a uh, stepchild. Um, we, got, uh, we got the new car we're building, the Lexus. We call it side piece. So it's, it's got everything. And I, I play, I got another things in the works right now and it'll be called, uh, its name will be alimony, but it's just, it's just something that keeps the brand going. And it'll always do that. I'll always come up with names to be able to do it. Every car that I drive or affiliated with will have its own identity. Man, that's awesome. You know, Justin, one of the things that really impressed me that, uh, you are, every bit put your uh put your actions where your words are with your race fans i got to see you uh have a a fan start up your car that that had to be one of the most heart touching moments and i know that has to still touch your heart every time you see that yeah uh that was uh that was that was one of the first times uh i did that like i said i try to I try to give people experiences. I remember growing up when I was a kid and being able to go around and do stuff. And I, I used to always say I wanted to, I wanted to, I got to sit in cars, but I wanted to start one up, like even as a young age. And, and I get it. It's a lot of money in these cars and I have a lot of money in my car, but I tell there's, there's certain times you can do stuff that, that it makes you stand out and you give somebody the experience of a lifetime. They're, uh, and letting that one fan start up the car, I mean, he still hits me up to this day, and we, we talk about it. And uh, whenever I go um, back to uh, Illinois next year, uh, I'm sure we'll probably be hitting that back up uh, later next year. They haven't sent us the schedule yet. But I already told him he can come right back out. I mean, we'll, we'll probably do it a fucking again. But it's just it was an experience for him. And I try to give everybody experience. All the kids, they come around. We allow them to sit in the car. We try to do stuff with it. I, uh, I'll turn it on. I let them hit the trans brake. They get to go around. They get to tell all their friends that they sat in that car. Um, and I mean, I, I kind of, I watch everybody just to make sure that 
because there is stuff that you can do that could possibly hurt the performance or, or mess something up inside the car. But everybody that I've dealt with so far, they've been pretty respectful and they, they listen, they touch what you tell them to touch and they stay away from the other stuff. So, um, and I've seen other people start to do it. I made, I made a post the other day and I, I put on the post that I was putting people in the car and now you see a bunch of people putting people in the car and then everybody took it out of context. They were like, you're not the first one. Well, dumbasses, I didn't say I was the first one that did it. I just said that I do it and make it publicly, and now everybody's doing it and making it public. But that's good. That's why I tell people all the time, I am the least hating person on the planet. I literally will never hate on somebody that's doing better than me. Just because as someone's doing better than me, it makes me strive to want to do better for myself. So that's why I tell people all the time, like people will literally hate on somebody and for no reason. And they got the same 24 hours in a day than, than what I do or some of the other people that are that are higher-end drivers. <coughs> but Wow, Justin. Just, just a great show, and we appreciate you coming on here. You're probably down to about 3% on your, on your phone. But we just want to tell you that we appreciate you coming on here, your yeah. time, and, and taking time to educate some of us old farts on what the, the newest trend is in drag racing. For sure. And if y'all got any questions, I mean, right now, I just checked my phone. It's at 11. So, I mean, oh, if you want to get one more, on, there. you can, y'all yeah. can ask whatever you want. I'm an open book. I will literally answer anything. Yeah, I, I got one more. I, I just, you know, there's a lot of NHRA fans, you know, in this, you know, in the in the comments right now. And obviously, I'm sure there's some supporters of yours as well. But for people who want to get into No Prep Kings, just kind of talk about like the format. How do you get invited? You know, qualifying. How do you gain points per round? Just kind of fill us in on the kind of like the format of No Prep Kings. So, so no, no prep kings. What people got to understand is, uh, no prep kings is uh, uh, a TV show first. It, it's it's got to be about. It is a TV show first. It is a race second. It is a TV show. Just so happily, we race at the time, and it makes the show. So that's one thing that a lot of people forget about, and they think they can come over, and they may be the baddest people in the world. And they may be the fastest and they may have millions and millions of dollars and think they can just throw it at it. But if you got no personality, it ain't shit. There's already 45 drivers over there. And I'm going to be honest with you. I, I tell people all the time, there's about 10 to 15 personalities. And the rest, they are just, uh, they're trying to have personality, but also are fillers. And I hate to say it like that, but everybody could be better if they want to be better. So you see the people that are, it's so different than when you go and watch a, a movie. You have certain actors that are bigger than the other actors. And that's just how it is. And and some people will have it easier than others because of the time that they put in and the work that they come in. Now, to get invited, uh, anybody's allowed to come out and run the future class. You're not going to come out and run the future class. And if you win two events, you're not getting pulled up. That doesn't work like that. You literally have to put in your time. And it doesn't even matter if you win. It's about if you could be good for TV and you could be good for the show. If you're beneficial for the show and they see that, they will bring you up. I, I feel like I got a little lucky on my end because, one, I was good friends with Kai, Bodie, Ryan, Daddy Dave. They put a good word in. But I went out there and I ran five races and uh, uh, um, was able to win a few of them. But I, I literally – I wasn't – I wasn't cocky, but I wasn't scared. I was out there. I came from a grudge racing background, so I talked shit. I had fun with it. And that's why I tell people all the time. I literally have fun with everything I do, from racing to talking shit to making my post on Facebook. It's all comedy to me. I don't take none of it serious because at the end of the day, there's a lot more serious shit going on in the world than what we got going on. So that's why it's it's beneficial to, to, to just have fun with it. And then, like I said, if I'm not having fun, I'll sell it and I'll go do something else. But right now, I'm having fun. So, yes, you can come out and run the future class. Alex Laughlin came out and ran the future class for a couple races. I know he got online. And he's like, oh, they'll never invite me. He needs to come out and put in his time. They don't give a fuck who you are. They don't care who you are. <laughs> don't matter what kind of clout you got. If you, you got to come put in your time, and if you're good for the show, you will get brought up. If you're not good, your ass will stay in the fucking future class. And it's as simple as that. There you well, go. Justin, we appreciate your time, man. Thank you so much for coming on here. And uh, we hope to have you back again sometime soon. Yeah, let me know. All right, man. Thank you, Justin.
All right. Thanks, All right, Justin. See you, buddy. That was awesome. Wow. Wow. Okay, for all of those uh, who ordered the Scotty Cannon Nitro shirts from Competition Plus Apparel, they begin shipping next week. But if you haven't, uh, let's roll the commercial and tell them what they need to get, and then we'll bring on Corey McCaleck next. Corey Mahalik, a.k.a. React 104. How's it going, man? Thanks for joining us here tonight. Man, that guy is an absolute energy factory. What an <laughs> awesome interview. <laughs> man, we got everybody in the dark tonight, don't we? <laughs> yeah, uh, this is the, the glamorous life that people don't talk about. Just off the, the back end of a near all-nighter, worked on a video for Josh Hart, drove 12 hours, now sitting in the, the Walmart parking lot, five hours from Dallas, somewhere in Arkansas, getting ready to head down to the stampede of speed, but we're really pumped about this week. This will be our first time at that race, and I think it's going to be a lot of fun. Corey, for, for our uh, viewers who may not know just how talented you are, this guy can drive a top alcohol dragster to a national event win. He can shoot the most incredible video stuff, like the Steven Spielberg of drag racing, and uh, edit like nobody's business. Tell me, uh, tell me how one led to the other, or did it? Is that how it happened? Yeah, it's actually a, it kind of comes in the reverse order of the way you just described it. So I got into the sport of of drag racing back in the the heyday of the IHRA. I, I uh, grew up in a small town in Ohio that happened to be the same hometown as Mark Thomas, one of the greatest drivers of all time in that series, literally the winningest uh, championship driver of all time in that series. And uh, my brother and dad were very into motorsports at that point and they had gone to a few races with him and I went just to, to support them but seeing that in person for the first time was what really set the hook and I've been stuck with it ever since and did not have the the most mechanical knowledge when I first got it started but I did have a camera and that was something that really got me interested as someone that grew up watching the the glory days of things like NFL films and things like that I didn't see that in the sport of drag racing I thought there was a real opportunity to to showcase the stars, the cars, and just how everything in the, the sport is larger than life. And that's something that's just continued into this day, even as I'm racing along some of those people that I still consider to be heroes myself. So, I mean, I just got to ask right off the top, like, how did you even learn to do what you do, man? I mean, the, the work you put out is just amazing. I mean, from the videography, the editing, everything, just how did you learn how to do all this? Trial and error, 100%. Uh, <laughs> I, I did go to school for, for marketing. Uh, I, I work at an agency uh, as my full-time gig, but in terms of trying to figure out how to shoot drag racing, just being a fan for as long as I have, um, I think what I tried to bring is showing that you, you see the, da the the daily broadcasts and things like that of the actual events, and there's a great place for the sport in that, and that's the, the way to, to tell the full story of what's happening, but to show the, the behind the scenes, whether it's from a team perspective, showing certain angles or views that you get, I think, as a fan that really attach you to the sport and recreate that in, in video form. I think that's part of my biggest passion about that is just trying to reconnect memories and, and just how special it is being at the track outside of what you see from those standard angles on the, the normal broadcast. You know, Corey, when, when you first came onto the scene as a videographer, and a lot of people don't remember this, you came out with the incredible uh, – video of Pat Dakin that mm -hmm. absolutely embarrassed the NHRA's uh, I don't know video department it embarrassed them like who the heck is this guy and wow we got to figure out how to take that video down <laughs> yeah that, that video actually it got me in a little bit of trouble with the NHRA so I was working for Pat uh, at the time for two years and throughout my time um, my brother and I we were both working on the clutch on the car Whenever I would have a little bit of downtime, I slowly collected footage over the course of two years. And when we decided to go out and get our license in the alcohol car, I was like, I'm going to put together a video that just kind of shows 
what it's like being a crew member within the NHRA. And that was my, my first ever, I, I guess, association with anything that kind of went viral. And it really took off back in the day. Um, it was something that I, it just got shared like crazy on Facebook. And then next thing I knew, like three days later, I had an email in my inbox from the NHRA media department saying that, while they really appreciated what it was doing for the sport and how, how great it portrayed it, it was kind of taking a few liberties with their uh, their footage policy. So unfortunately, that, that got taken down for a little bit. But since then, we've been working quite quite a bit together and, and the, the relationship is going strong. But uh, for a little bit, I thought, oh, boy, I may never even be able to get to race in any tribe before I have a chance to, to strap in a car. So that was scary for a moment, but it ended up good in the long run. Hey, Corey, we have a question here from the Monday Morning Racer. Uh, he shares all your work. I mean, he shares everybody's work. I mean, great dude for the sport. But he goes, on average, how many hours goes into cinematic efforts that uh, React 104 produces? Oh, yeah. I mean, it, it definitely varies on whatever the final deliverable is. But um, it's kind of stupid, to tell you the truth. Uh, so usually I'll go to the, the, the full event. Um, I will be there from first thing in the morning, Friday, till after hopefully the winter circle on Sunday. So shooting for three days straight. And then the editing process, depending on, let's say it's uh, one of the recent pieces I did for Ron Caps when he won Bristol, um, all, all in all, there was probably about 115 hours in editing that for something that was just under three minutes, um, which I said, that sounds really dumb, but to be able to get those type of details and the movement, one of the things I, I really try to strive for is in those videos, the, the camera never stops moving. Um, and the way that it's continuously floating from shot to shot making sure that each transition is, is fully ma um, mapped out. Um, it, it takes, it, it just flat out takes a long time to do so. But I think that that's what also helps separate it to be sort of a unique piece for what it really is. And I think really draw you in and, and just be so immersive from start to finish, I hope. Hey, thank you way up, dude. Uh, I'm working on a, a Legends of Series on Pat Musi as we speak. He's next up. And if you haven't watched the Ed McCullough one, that's, that one's coming across pretty good. Now, I have to credit a lot of what I've learned in video because I have to tell you, I had zero, zilch, nada experience at editing videos until I, until I started hanging around this Corey McCallick guy, you know, and Les Mayhew and and, and all of the greats. And I, I, I kind of kind of borrowed, copied a little bit of every, just a little bit of what you guys did. How does it make you feel to know that your work inspires others? Oh, I mean, it's really cool because um, it's the sport that inspires me. So if, if uh, seeing what my vision ends up being is something that inspires other people, I think that's the ultimate gratification. Um, Darren, I'm not sure if you're very familiar with this or not, but basically any time that Bobby and I are in the same room together, he tells me that someday he's going to be dangerous with video. And I've been telling <laughs> him for years that he's, he's dangerous. It's really cool to see, though, between, like you mentioned, uh, I, I watch less of stuff, um, what Monday Morning Racer is doing, what you're putting together, uh, Bobby. Everybody has a different way of telling a story within the sport. But at the same time, the same goal for everybody is to advance it and get it out to people and, and just show how cool it is, how great the people that are involved. And the more that we can do it as a group, I think the better off we're going to be. Hey, hey, Corey, just keep this between us. Right? I know we're live right now, but just keep this between us. When you retire, just kind of, you know, teach me all your tricks, all right? <laughs> that sounds good it's a labor of love that's what i tell everybody i mean you just get lost in the details and it's just so cool too because i mean like when you're you're sitting there putting those together you remember just the moments of what were happening during that event and just how special it is to be at some of these these events and um i've been fortunate now to do stuff with ihra I, i've done a lot of work with the pdra over the last two years and then also nhra in addition to where i race at um it's just awesome to see just how much passion goes into every single event, every single pass, and to try to be able to relay that story. It's a responsibility, but it's also something that I really enjoy doing. When we reintroduced the brand, the Competition Plus TV brand, we tried to launch it in, you know, 2005, but the technology just wasn't there in 2006. Uh, a lot of people don't know that one of the first videos to come, come out of the uh, new vision of Competition Plus TV was produced by you, Corey. Uh, it featured a rookie driver named Brittany Force. Remember that? Yeah, one? things have panned out quite well for Brittany since then. Uh, yeah, we did a, a, a project on Brittany. We did one on Courtney as well when uh, she was coming into her second year, I believe. 
and that was down at uh, West Palm Beach. And that was just such a, I mean, I'm, I'm eternally grateful for that from you, Bobby. It definitely stemmed from the piece that we did on Pat Dakin. But that is what has allowed me, I think, to have some of the additional opportunities where you've connected me with many of the members within the, uh, the, the media room uh, within the NHRA national events, and then also the connections that have been gained from there as well. So um, from me to you, I, I really appreciate that opportunity once again. You know, for you, Corey, I don't know if you saw this, but a few races ago, and I'm sure they still do it now, but I was watching NHRA.TV and they show one of your, your videos on the big screen. I just want to know how much of an honor was that for you to see, you know, your work, you know, every, all the hours and, and dedication you spent into your work being shown up on the big screen on NHRA at the racetrack and on NHRA.TV. Just how much of an honor was that for you? Yeah, that's super cool. Um, I had, it's almost like a, a Twilight Zone experience too, where um, we had just got done running our last round of qualifying this year at Indy. And I was walking through the pits to, to go grab a couple clutch discs from someone. And I, I heard a song and I heard some voiceovers that sounded very familiar. And during a, um, a break in between, I think there might've been an oil down during one of the fuel sessions, they were showing the Indy video as well. Mm. Um, so it's really cool to see that it's being embraced by them. Um, I actually also got word too. So just finished a piece with uh, Steve Torrance from uh, when I worked with him down in Charlotte, and it sounds like they're going to be using it on the actual Fox broadcast this, nice. uh, this this coming weekend, which will be, I think, a first for me as well, which is just really cool. I mean, it's like I said, it, from the very beginning, you just, I just like being involved in the sport. I, I, I dream in drag racing to this day, um, and, and that's kind of what comes out when when we make these different types of videos and stuff like that. So to see them get some, some extra mileage and hopefully pump some people up, get ready for uh, whatever race is coming up, that's that's the best. Congratulations, man. Well, I tell I tell you, yeah, all right. Let's let's put the camera aside for a little bit here. We all know you're the badass with that. All right. Let's talk about this domination thing you got going on at Z Max Dragway, <laughs> you're top alcohol dragster. And, and the the tell first tell us about how you been managed to be so successful there, and tell us what is this fun fun that flip all about yeah i i'll tell you what for all the places to, to have some good luck at zmax is a pretty cool one to to be that way um we've actually had some of our best days and also some of our worst days at that place so um we've raced there five times now uh been to the final three times one twice um uh, but then also uh, had a pretty bad oil fire uh last not this past spring but the uh, the spring before that when we um kicked one of the rods out and it cut an oil line. So it seems like it either goes really well there or it doesn't go very well at all. So um, very, very much a, a big fan of that place and hopefully go back there in the spring. And that four wide stuff, it was our second time getting to do it this year. It is it is hard, honestly. Um, I, I told people going back to the second time, like, I'm, I'm not really pumped up about doing it. It's, it's really cool. But it's it's so wild to think that just throwing two extra lights on top of a Christmas tree um, can really mess with your mind that much. But when you're in a car and you are looking across the, the tree from either lanes two or three, it, it definitely kind of eats at your brain a little bit. You need to be really locked in to make sure that you're doing what you need to do. But um, we've been able to have these opportunities, like you mentioned, Bob, uh, Bobby, because of uh, being able to acquire different partners over the past couple of years. We started out our operation. We purchased our car in 2015, started racing it in 2017. And the first couple of years, it was two races a year, three races a year, and slowly worked up to now where we're running our biggest schedule, which is not large in comparison to a lot of teams, but we're running seven races a year this year. And then we're, we're locked in with Fun That Flip again for seven races as well. Um, they have provided a tremendous opportunity to uh, an alcohol team like ourselves that is not someone that's coming from a legacy family of racers, uh, two relatively young brothers still within the sport that have been able to, uh, no pun intended, fund ourselves into what is now what we believe a, a pretty competitive ride and um, something that will give us a lot of momentum going into next year as well. But they are um, essentially meeting in the uh, people that want to invest in private real estate and people that are doing fix and flips. They're meeting them in the middle to create opportunities for people to get their projects funded or for people that are interested in that actual funding portion of it. They have a tremendous success, success record in terms of providing a return on investment for investors and then also 
crazy fast to close for anybody that wants to get their their projects funded. So they've had a blast within the sport. Um, there's a, a lot of overlap with the types of fans and people that are involved in that type of work. They come every year. Their their company out and they're based in Cleveland tonight under fire in Norwalk, Ohio. And Bobby, I know that was your first time going there this year, and just a tremendous event for for them to see what the the showcase of, of the drag racing is in a, a short format uh, ordeal. So looking forward to having them back next year and hopefully continuing to build on it from there. So just going back to that Charlotte final, did you did, they, did the ladies kind of beat you up at the top end? You know, you're only male in that final round. They kind of beat you up at the, at the top end after that. And and also just a second question. Um, how do you go about juggling, you know, the videography side with the driving side? Like how do you kind of juggle both both uh, both professions? Yeah, that was, that was a unique final round for sure. Being the the only male racer that was left in that. I mean, top alcohol dragster is extremely strong right now from a diversity standpoint. Um, and some of the hardest running cars for the past few years, obviously with especially from the if you look at the championship standings, have been female driven. And they're not only um, are they fast cars, but a lot of them. I mean, if you're not you're not on your game, they're going to leave you at the starting line, and your 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 race is over before it even got started. So, um, yeah, that's been something that uh, has been really cool to to be a part of. And then, sorry, Gary, what was the second part of your question? No, just how you juggle both professions of the videography mm -hmm. side with jumping behind the race yeah. car. Yeah, I mean, my passion for sure is, is at this point definitely from a, a driving perspective. But a lot of opportunities have, have opened up this year. Um, it, thanks in, in part to Natalie Torrance. Um, Natalie manages a... Uh, glory list if you will of the who's who of, of, of nhra and she's connected me with uh ron caps which actually bobby that was another one that we worked on the art of never giving up uh was something we did down in, in palm beach when caps was still always that cinderella story so um yeah but she's been the one that's that's really created a lot of opportunities that i think next year as well um maybe we've got some exciting things we've got a meeting that's that's going to be happening this weekend down in dallas and then uh, I'll be closing out the year with Josh Hart, Ron Caps, and Steve Torrance in Vegas and uh, Moto. So this will be our last race with our car, but I'll be able to attend those other events to hopefully um, tell some really cool stories as the, the countdown wraps up, as all three of them are still very much in it. Yeah, for sure. You, you know, uh, you get so much of the credit with the top fuel team and everything, and you stand out so much because of your video stuff. And I, I think every time I see you and, and, and your brother Kyle together that somewhere a bet Midler is the wind beneath my wings is going to be playing <laughs> in the background. I mean, that's how it is with you guys. I mean, you, you guys are just like inseparable. Right? Yeah. And, and honestly, if it, it, going back to the start of the sport, because he got involved and that's what kind of got me going along. Um, to, to where we're at today. Uh, I could not run this operation that we have by myself. And, and I think he would say the same um, between from everything from the amount of effort that goes into preparing everything to acquiring the funding, et cetera. We're lockstep on that. And, and it will always be a Mahalik Brothers Racing team name and never just Mahalik Racing, just because um, we really want to emphasize that portion of the the relationship and and what it takes to to be successful in this and um we've had a lot of real good times in the sport but also racing's been a part um that's helped us get through some tougher times in the past um so it will always be something that i think we'll continue to to go back to and and hopefully continue us driving forward and and seeing what we're capable to do in, in such a unique environment I, I tell you one one other thing and didn't mean to cut you off there darren oh, no, but uh when you guys had the tragedy happen a couple of years ago to see the way that you two interacted with one another, just, just the brotherly love you showed what brothers are supposed to be. I mean, do you ever look, I know you don't like to look back on moments like that, but you, you have to look back and see just how much love won over a bad situation. Yeah, and and not only I think was was it love between uh, him and I, but the way that the entire community embraced it as well. And you see that time and time again within the sport. Obviously, with the stuff that happened with Dom a few years back, um, anytime someone within the sport is impacted in a manner like that, um, it's almost to the point, especially being on the other side of it, that it can be overwhelming. 
just how much there is. Uh, you saw that with Bill Bader Sr. this year, just the way that everybody comes in to do anything that is very possible to help in the smallest or the largest way possible, um, they will do so. And uh, as cliche as everybody says that racing is a, a big family, um, that the proof is in the pudding every single time. And you never want to see anything like that, but also it, it gives you hope and um, perspective of, of where everybody stands within uh, one another and, and just see how supportive everybody can be. For sure. And Corey, this isn't really a, a question. This is more so like, I mean, you drive a 270 mile power badass race car. You're a badass vide videographer. I mean, as, as busy as you are, I just love how humble you stay throughout this whole thing. I mean, I've shared a lot of your work and I've seen people, a lot of people share a lot of your work too. And you literally, you're literally saying thank you and resharing the posts and stuff like that. So, I mean, just the way you take the time out to thank everybody for sharing your work and stuff like that. I just really just applaud that. And it's just really cool how humble you stay throughout all these things. Cause I mean, like I said, you're so busy, you're a race car driver, videographer, but the fact that you still reach out and tell people, thank you and all this stuff. I think that's really cool. Oh, that's, that's, that's cool to hear for sure. Um, I mean, I'm just, I just enjoy getting to do this. I'm sure just as much as you guys do every single week with getting to come on these shows, um, Darren, just watching how, how much your channel has grown over the past couple of years. I mean, we almost, I feel like when I started React 104 was when you were really starting to get your traction as well. And um, I remember when you first reached out to me on YouTube and just said, hey, keep up what you're doing. And I was like, this, this is awesome. And you were coming in with the same deal where like, I'm trying to show a different way of, of recapping races or events. You're coming in with your own angle as well to tell the stories about the history of the sport and some of the greatest battles that have ever happened. And those are the things that um, I think are just a for Bobby as well, we're kind of riding on the coattails of what he did when he started Competition Plus. So everybody's just trying to, to be a piece of the puzzle. And I, I, I do really appreciate when people just take the time to watch something. I mean, you're just bombarded with everything on social media these days. So if I can get you to stop for 90 seconds to, to view something, I appreciate that because I know you could be doing a lot of other things for sure. So, Corey, what's going to happen to all the video stuff when you become a, a big time top fuel racer? <laughs> I hope that's a problem I have to solve one day, Bobby. Uh, that seems like it's a, a long way off, but um, I do have some plans uh, for hopefully being able to grow this in the future. I've had a great run uh, with my my full time gig, and I've had a lot of people that have come to me with some opportunities that just given with racing and family and um, my full time job, I couldn't take them on. And sooner or later, I gotta I think just kind of dip my toe in that water and, and give it a shot. If it works out, that's awesome. We'll see what we can grow it to be, but. If not, then um, we'll continue to do kind of what I'm doing right now. But I've got some ideas for maybe how to expand the team and, and some additional people that may want to type, uh, work on some of this type of stuff. But right now, it's, it's one of those things where if we're racing an event, I just unfortunately, I don't have time to be able to, to go shoot or do anything along those lines, just given my duties as not only the driver, but also working on the car. So um, it's in the back of my mind for sure, Bobby. I don't know if the top fuel thing is ever going to happen. I'd love to, but trying to be realistic about where, where everything's at. But uh, if we get to that point, I'll call you up and I'll help you, have you help me brainstorm for how we solve this issue. <laughs> <laughs> so put me behind the camera. But, there you go. Hey, I appreciate you still uh, being willing to help us little guys out here, you know, in, in our projects. And you'll see some of Corey's great work in uh, upcoming documentaries on Ricky Smith and on uh, Law Barnett which uh, that one's shaping up to be a pretty, pretty powerful one. But uh, Corey, uh, anything you'd like to add that we haven't touched on before we let you go tonight and get back on the road? I don't think so. Um, I just appreciate you guys um, giving me an opportunity to kind of share the story of, the, uh, of what's going on with some of the video work. It is still kind of relatively new and, and I get some new people that reach out to me here and they're saying, Hey, I don't know, ever, ever stumbled across this stuff. So, um, if you do want to keep up with it, um, it's React 104 I'm, I'm on Facebook, YouTube, um, Instagram, all those types of things. And uh, like I mentioned, I'll be putting out a few more things throughout the rest of this year. And hopefully next year will be a big year as well. But thank you to you both for giving me the opportunity to, to come on and kind of chat about this and, and be a part of the show. It's, it's really cool. So I, I appreciate it. Hey, we appreciate you. And we appreciate what you're doing to help chronicle drag racing for future generations. Darren is just an incredible young man. He's eventually going to push me out in the wheelchair here and take over. <laughs> and uh, But we just got to be able to get him from point A to point B without crashing every once in a while. 
I know that story well. And uh, Darren, you're in good hands. Oh, man. Uh, thank you, man. I really do appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you. For sure. <laughs> okay. Actually, can I get one last question in, though? Yeah, you're running the show. Go ahead. Yeah. And, it, it, it is, and it's not my question because Money Morning Racer loves to pick people's brains. And so he has one more question. I want to get in. Sure. He says, what is the whole package for teams? Your cinematic post to, uh, to a still post. What should teams be doing to tell their story and not wait for the media to come along? Yeah, I think it, and it's actually probably kind of follows up with what Justin was, was talking about. I think it's the people that really want to have their story told. Um they are doing a little bit of the legwork themselves by whether it's reaching out to somebody or coming up with these specific ideas to be able to um, make sure that it gets documented properly. I love working with the, the people that I'm working with right now. Um, like So using Ron as an example, I'll go to the track on Friday and we'll say our lows and, and get caught up. And we'll talk about what's the type of story that we want to tell this time around. Ron is so um, passionate about sticking out on social media and having stuff that is unique and um, stuff that really captivates people. So you see the way that he does stuff with the um, the wing stops every time uh, he goes to a track, the stuff that he does when he goes to the campground, etc. It is something that is always on his mind to continue to drive his narrative. Um, as much as I think everybody would love for yourself or Bobby or Drag Illustrated, whoever, to reach out to them and knock on their door to tell their stories. That will help happen here and there, but not a consistent cadence to keep their name out there all the time. It's the people that are not in a look at me type way, but in the way of, I want to showcase what we're doing as a team, what we're doing as a sport, et cetera, that are consistently getting the media attention. It's because they're putting in the effort as well. And um, I, I've appreciated the, the ones that have reached out to me um, I have actually never reached out to a team to to do any type of work. It's been the other way around. So I know that it is a mutual interest and it's something that people want to make, for the lack of a better term, some really cool shit. Um, then I go in there, I'm fired up, they're fired up, and then we were able to make some some really cool cool things along the way. So um, I think it's just if you're you're pushing it in a respectful manner that you want to be um, able to showcase what you're going on. There's more than enough people out there that want to help you tell that story. And it's not always just going to come to them coming to you. Awesome. Awesome. It's awesome, man. So proud of you. Uh, proud to be a part of it, Bobby. Uh, I'm going to go take a nap here in this Walmart parking lot. <laughs> head down to Dallas. <laughs> be safe. We'll see you. We'll, right. we'll see do. You Thanks, part. guys. You take care. Appreciate it. Thank you. What a show, Darren. I think that's a country song, he said, in this Walmart parking lot. I think that's a country music song, if I'm not mistaken. I forgot who it's by, though. But, yeah, I think it is. I don't know. I think That's it is, probably yeah. been written a few times. Sang a few <laughs> times. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, anyway, great show tonight with Justin Swanstrom bringing us a, a just a, a really wide open, straightforward view of the No Prep Kings and then a course Corey McClanahan uh, Corey McCalick sorry I didn't mean to try to call him Corey McClanahan <laughs> Corey McCalick uh, I mean taking the drag racing's video presentation to a to a to a whole new level and uh so uh your thoughts on this weekend's uh NHRA fall nationals oh man so motorplex Who, this... who, who's winning who's losing so I gotta predict winners yeah, I guess so. Might as well. Uh, okay. So I'm going to go a little different route. So we got Pro Stock Motorcycle. I think it's a two horse race. Right? It's not over in any class, but two horse race. Obviously, you got Joey Glassstone, Matt Smith. Kind of, I think that storyline is the old guard versus the new guard. You think about. You think about 2010 when Ellie Tonkalet took on Andrew Hines for that championship. You think about the year later where uh, Hector Rana Jr. took on uh, uh, Eddie Craywick that year. It's kind of like the old guard versus the new guard. I'm curious to see who comes out on top in that one. I think Matt Smith has the vantage right now, but don't count out Joey Glassstone whatsoever. Pro stock, like I said, it's not over, but it's Eric over. Anders, it's over. It's yeah. over. Yeah. It's over. I didn't want to say yeah, that, but, but okay. Going back to the Matt Smith versus Joey Gladstone, is that the Happy Gilmore versus Shooter McGavin match? I, I I don't have no idea what that is. Adam Sandler. Oh my gosh. No, that didn't. movie probably came out before you were born anyway. You were born last week, right? 
<laughs> yeah, yeah. Pro stock is done. I predict the Camaro will win it. Oh yeah, that that's a great prediction, Bobby. Great prediction. <laughs> our, our Nitro, funny, car. funny car. What are we doing? Nitro funny car. So obviously this year it's been Robert Hyde, Ron Cabas, Matt Hagen, Bob Tasca, you know, as the as the heavy hitters, you know, all year long. But I feel like Robert Hyde and Ron Caps have definitely separated themselves from the pack. Quick little stat here. And I've said this on previous shows though. Quick little stat. So after three races in the countdown in 2017, Ron Caps led Robert Hyde by 46 points. Fast forward to 2022, Robert Hyde leads Ron Caps by 46 points after the first, first three races of the countdown. Kind of cool out of the symmetry here five years later. Obviously, Robert Hyde came out on top in 2017. We'll see who comes out on top here in 2022. It'll be a lot of fun. I tell you what, I've been predicting it for three races. Uh, maybe the fourth time is a charm. I believe Bob Task is going to get him one here in Texas. Bob Task. You think he's going to win this, this win this weekend? I think he's got, he's due for one. He's due to break out. Well, and, and it's going to be a matter of if he races Caps, Caps or Height or Hagen. Well, here goes another stat. Obviously, it doesn't matter what you've done in the past, but he did win this race 10 years ago in 2012. So there you go, Bob Tasker. There, there you go. go. Do you still do you still think he has a championship? He still do you think he still think he has a chance to win the championship though? Uh, it's it's going to be tough. Uh, uh, I, as much as I I, I want to put uh, Tasker in the in, in the the running for the championship because we're uh, Roy Hill Drag Racing School graduates. <laughs> <laughs> from the class of 1995, uh, I think that uh, uh, Caps and and, uh, and Robert Height, uh, that's going to be who it's going to go down to. For sure. And then who's your pick for top field? I mean, it can go any way coming into this coming into this weekend. I mean, wow. I mean, Brittany Force, three consecutive second, second round losses in a row. Did she step up this weekend? I think it's going to go down to Justin Ashley and Steve Torrance. Okay, there you go. There you go. I believe th those two are going to battle it out, and I believe they're going to battle it out for the rest of the season. Those two are going to be going to be they're 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 the two best horses in the race right now. I agree. I agree. And we'll see how it all plays out this weekend at the Texas NHRA Fall Nationals. Hey, Bobby, when are you head out to Dallas, I'm already here. Oh, you're oh yeah, you're Waxahachie. You're right. You're right. There That's you are. Right. There you are. Yeah. Yeah, awesome. I went down to Buddy Hull's shop, man. I gotta tell you, man. That that new dragster, you'll get a look at it in tomorrow's edition of competitionplus.com. What an incredible paint scheme. Uh it, it's definitely pink, that's for sure. Mm -hmm. And for sure. uh Buddy Hull just took me around his shop. Of course, I got lost down there and I Found my way back to his shop with chainsaws in the background being started, you know, out here in Texas. You don't make a wrong turn too many times. <laughs> a little uh, Texas Chainsaw Massacre reference right there. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> awesome, awesome. Well, uh, anything you want to touch on before you get out of here, Bobby? I mean, it's oh, been a great oh, show. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. The, the, the Texas Chainsaw Massacre. Did you know there was actually a version of that in drag racing? Back Do when tell. me and your dad was watching Soul Train on Saturday afternoons. Do tell. Okay, so Raymond Beetle goes through the lights at the 1981 Winter Nationals. His car goes out a hard top, comes back a convertible because <laughs> the wind got in and blew the roof off of it. Well, here's Kenny Bernstein says, oh, I have a spare body. So they pull Kenny Bernstein's spare body out, cut the roof off of it, was was duct taping, pot riveting a roof off of Kenny Bernstein's funny car onto Raymond Beetle. See, what you had is a Blue Max with a red roof. And <laughs> guess who they were racing in the final round? Billy Meyer, the nice. owner of the Texas Motorplex, who had, I think he, he blew up every motor he had in the train that weekend and blew it up another one. And uh, won the race, so uh, he's he's probably not the only racer that ever won the race and lost. <laughs> that that's funny. Bernstein is well known for handing out bodies because you, you mentioned Billy Meyer. Because five years later, you know, yeah. at, at the U.S. Nationals, Billy Meyer blows it up big time as a big fire. Well, Bernstein loans him his his Budweiser uh, body, and Billy Meyer obviously goes on and loses in the final round to Mike Dunn. But 
I mean, yeah, Bernstein is uh, known for handing out Budweiser bodies to people. Ber Bernstein was going to get his TV time. It didn't matter <laughs> how he got it. He was going to get his TV time. There you go. There you go. What's up? What's Bernstein been up to? Have you talked to him lately? I haven't talked to him lately. Enjoying retirement as far as mm -hmm. I can see. We do have his Legends, the series episode on uh, Competition Plus TV YouTube page. And if you haven't... Uh, if you haven't been on uh, been on the uh, the YouTube channel, you should go through there and get lost in the coverage. I mean, you can watch for days on nothing but the coverage of the old Legends of Series. And we got some new storytellers coming up. Mm -hmm. uh, we got Pat Musi and Roy Hill and Ricky Smith and another one coming up. And then we got uh, Billy Meyer with another storyteller. about the day he was – Never so so happy to see a burn center. <laughs> <laughs> oh, final question. So you mentioned Ricky Smith. Obviously, last race of the Pro Mod Series here this weekend. Do you think he could pull it off? Uh, I, th I think that it's over with. I think okay. Chris Thorne, as, as far as I can tell, and I, I can't say for certain because I didn't see if there was a re-entry or anything. Uh, but it's just hearsay that Ricky pulled out. And I really don't blame him. That's oh, okay. a long way to go. With, with with such a slim chance to 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 win a championship gotcha gotcha uh, so gotcha. you know we'll we'll give ricky a call we'll talk to him we've got some gotcha. we've got a documentary on the works on him and we also have a legends of series on ricky that we did some years back mm -hmm. that and don schumacher several of them mm -hmm. and sam we miss you guy we miss you big guy Come on back next week to us. Yeah, for sure. For sure. Definitely. Miss you, Sam. Get back on here next week. Get well soon, man. All right. Comment right here. Oh, no. Just Jaggers and Central says uh, Ricky uh, Ricky isn't on the entry list. So, yeah, I didn't even I didn't even know that. So, wow, that's yeah. big yeah. time news right there. Yeah. Yeah, that that was that that happened last week. So, mm -hmm. uh, Darren, uh, you you have the, you know, California Hot Rod reunion coming up. And you get yes, the sir. key to to uh, to Bobby's car, and you get to drive to do the notebook and yourself and, and veteran photographer Dave Kamel at the California Hot Rod reunion. Tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, it's gonna be a lot of fun. It's the final race of the 2022 NHRA Heritage Series season. I got a big time battle in top field between Brett Williamson and Tyler Hilton, only separated by two rounds. So it's gonna be a lot of fun. And like you said, I'll be doing the notebook out there, trying to get some great. Uh, breaking news stories in the, in the notebook, uh, going to do some, uh, some basically just updating you guys on the results, you know, who's number one qualifier, the winners, you know, uh, recaps of qualifying. So it's gonna be a lot of fun to be out there all three days. So uh, make sure to tune into the competition plus uh, website and see all my work. It's gonna be a lot of fun. Yeah. I just pray that you don't put the car in the wall. Just don't I put won't. it in the wall. I won't. You got one job. <laughs> I won't. Yeah. I'm I'm no, I have to... full confidence. And, 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 and I tell you guys, uh, Darren is, Big in the future of competitionplus.com. And I couldn't have thought of somebody that would uh, join along with us. And uh, you'll start to see his byline more and more and more. So take us home. For sure. I'm going to drive that thing straight down the groove, give myself a career best ETN speed, make you proud. That's what I'm going to do it. Amen. I have no doubt. <laughs> well, thank you guys all for tuning in tonight, here tonight for the 97th episode of the Competition Plus Power Hour. And we see you guys next week. Good night, everybody.